a sustainable forest trade journey is what you're going to experience, we have four stops that we want to take you through. Endangered species, trends in China, social environmental data, and smallholders and forest investments. The journey is starting now. We'd like to start by taking a closer look at the truly incredible biodiversity that can be found in the Lower Mekong region. So uh, the region contains some of the most biologically diverse habitats in the world. It's also one of the largest tiger habitats uh, in the world. It accounts for 25% of the global freshwater catch. And it hosts more than 20,000 plant species, including some really rare and unique tree species. In fact, we're still learning about the biodiversity in the Lower Mekong. Just last January, they, they released a really interesting report that listing 224 new species coming from the, the Mekong region. This biodiversity is under intense threat due to the uh, amazing social and economic development in the region, but also pressure from the, the growing Chinese market. And CITES, the Convention on International Trade and in Indigenous Species in Wild Fauna and Flora, uh, works with governments to ensure that international trade does not threaten the survival of species. In China, there's a, a new article, Article 65, that was enacted in July 2020. And this will prohibit the um, import of illegal wood into China. What are the public regulations, policies, and guidelines that are working towards sustainable trade, that try to promote sustainable forest trade, as well as investment? There's a lot. But let's talk in terms of what's really driving some of the changes. And this is pressure from the market. We talk to certification um, systems and, and, and uh, initiatives. This is a diagram from CFCC or the China Forest Certification Council, which was established in the early 2000s. They have been endorsed by PFC um, as of 2014. And you'll see the numbers have really um, hugely increased since 2014 for both chain of custody and for forest management certification. Chinese demand is changing fast. It's rapidly growing and urbanizing. And, you know, it, it's 1.4 billion customers. And so the, the decisions that these consumers are making in terms of what they, what they buy, what they eat, uh, what to consume and you know, what furniture they buy, what, what how to build the houses has direct impact on regions like like the Mekong. It's very important to track social and environmental in outcomes in the forest sector um, to understand you know how the ecosystems are changing and but also what the most appropriate policy actions are. There are actually a range of, of, of platforms, data, and tools that can assist in monitoring and analyzing environmental data. What we're seeing is that navigating among this increasing long list of resources can be challenging for countries, for governments. We also have to recognize that local communities have their own issues that they want to monitor. And it may not be the same as what a national forest monitoring system looks like or is providing. Fourth stop, smallholders. The Lower Mekong, if we talk about forests, it's really about the smallholders. They ultimately are managing so much of the forest. We uh, at UNEP like to see uh, farmers and smallholders as entrepreneurs in, in the making, uh, essentially. And we're seeing that while there are some technical barriers, also in many cases, uh, smallholders basically lack the basic business skills to turn their livelihoods into genuine businesses that generate profits and create jobs. Local people are and should be the, the center of recovery of, of a, a green economy. We need the social cohesion at the local level. We need these communities to effectively have ability to enter the market and to stay in the market. Otherwise they will leave or they will produce something else at, at at the expense of the forest.